we'll just make sure I can, everyone can hear me all right, all right? Good. Uh, well, thank you for welcoming me to be the first of our Tech Talks. Uh, it was very exciting to see my name on the uh, list very first. So we'll get right into it. Um, today I want to talk to you all about lean thinking and how we can apply it to product development. You might notice we have another talk tonight that's kind of covering the same topic. Um, I think what you'll find is this will be a nice introduction because in 10 minutes we're just barely going to scratch the surface. Um, before we get into any of the information, I want to just have us all kind of ask ourselves a question. Why should we care about this thing lean? We're going to like learn what it is, but let's first ask why. And I think there's a really simple answer to that that's applicable to all of us, and we probably are feeling it right now, which is development is hard. I mean, any kind of work is hard, but specifically product development, engineering stuff is really hard. Um, with that, we have a limited number of resources, limited amount of time, and you need to employ amongst your team, amongst yourself, some method of organizing, managing, controlling that. Lean might not be like the best thing for you in, in your world, but it is a thing, and so we're going to talk about it. Um, in order to understand lean, and again, this is like whoosh, just barely scratching the surface, but I think we need to know three things. One, what is a basic workflow model in terms of how can we sort of put onto a more mathematical you know, object uh, the things that we're doing in relation to work? Um, we also need a definition of what lean is, so there's going to be a little history lesson here. And finally, uh, my one JavaScript joke per presentation, lean dot applied to product development. Um, modeling workflows. So before we really dive into this, I just want to show this quick slide, and this is a very simple diagram if we ignore the details. Um, what we see here, two servers, both being fed, you know, they're, they're right in line with one another, and there's two pieces of inventory. And Whenever we're going to talk to a team about how we're working, we need to create a model. Um, the most important thing about that is that we're describing the basic mechanics, not necessarily all the details. We're describing the size and location of the queues, right? Queues become very important in all sorts of uh, workflow management. And understanding that, we have to note that there's a large relationship between the inventory and the lead time. Uh, lead time, of course, is the time from when we very start the project to when we deliver it to the customer. So it's incredibly important in product development. And the more WIP, the more lead time we have. Um, not shown here, but we can kind of talk about it at some other point, are the effects of arrival rate variability. So for instance, if this person is feeding this person, right, and it's not going to always happen at the same rate. So in order to make sure that there's always something for this person to do, we have two and a half days of inventory. Right? This isn't intentional, but it's the effect of we always want our servers to have, um, to have work to do. Um, these can get very complicated very quickly, but again, we just need to understand the, the basics. We can make a model of a workflow. Um, now that we have a basic model, we really want to start to say, how can we control this workflow model? We don't want a descriptive model. We want a prescriptive model. We want to be able to control and optimize. And one of the things that we're going to optimize is the batch size. So, um, this is actually a pretty simple relationship, and I'm sure if any of you have had a basic economics class, you'll recognize this. It's the economic order quantity uh, relationship. And here, all we're saying is, as, as the batch size increases, the transactional cost goes down and the holding cost goes up. And somewhere in that is an optimum. Um, you might find this already when you're doing uh, git pull and, and branches, where I'd rather do a whole day's worth of work because it's easier to merge. Uh, at least you don't like to merge, and so we try to like avoid merging. But we know that um, when this happens, merge conflicts arise and they get bigger and bigger. So when we're in that, we, we sort of have a, uh, a batch size that's, that's towards the right side of the graph. Um, Henry Ford took a huge advantage of this when he was inventing and developing the assembly line for the Model T, right? He did things in gigantic branches and he brought down the unit cost because when the, transac or when the batch size is large, the transaction cost is low and the overall cost is low. So we sort of have this, this driver to always be there. But I'm telling you today that there is a better way. Um, the other thing worth mentioning is capacity utilization. If you were managing a team of engineers, and you were paying them all you know, $100,000 a year, you would want them to be highly utilized, right? You want 
all of their time to be spent programming. But if we do that, we approach on our capacity utilization, you know, nearing the 90 and 100, our queue size jumps way up. And we, of course, know from the relationship with queue size and lead time that as the queue size grows up, the lead time goes up. So if you want busy engineers, well, when somebody asks you for a new project, they have to wait a really long time. And these are just sort of the effects of a workflow system. But again, there's a better way. Um, we also note here, this is Little's Law, uh, basically just says that that relationship is real um, and we can prove it. And uh, as we mentioned, it's going to grow proportional to the queue size. So now on to lean thinking. And here we have a new and better way to manage workflow. Um, lean is essentially first used to describe the difference between Toyota and American car manufacturers in the 1990s. Uh, there were these guys, Daniel T. Jones and some other guy, right? There were just these guys writing for MIT, um, Sloan, or whatever management review, and they said, wow, why is it that these Japanese companies are so much better than us? Why do they outperform us? Um, now, lean is really more of a way of thinking rather than a descriptive description of a manufacturing system. And it has everything to do with focusing on value add and eliminating waste. Um, Toyota was, of course, not the first company to do this, but they are the best. And I think the most important thing that they do is continuously change the way that they go about doing their work. They're not ever going to say, well, that's just the way it is. They're striving to standardize and change and evolve. And I think that that's the big takeaway from lean thinking. So back to our model of the economic batch size. Like, like I said, Henry Ford allowed things to come over to the side. And what we ended up with was you know, gigantic lead times. Well, Toyota didn't have that. So they said, rather than letting the you know, parameter describe the situation, we're going to control the parameter. And we can do the same thing by lowering the transaction costs. So if we start to determine ways within the scope of work to make it easier to do smaller batches, if we encourage small batches of work, we'll lower the transaction costs, lower the batch size, lower the lead time. But we have to do those things to make the transaction costs go down. That doesn't happen automatically. Um, the same with uh, utilization, right? We, we don't want these long lead times, so we don't want our resources to be stable. So if we allow our resources to flex, let's say that you have you know, three people programming, one's on the back end, one's on the front end, and one's doing you know, testing. Well, if the testing person is busy and the person feeding him work uh, can, can continue working, but you know, if they're kind of like waiting for the testing person, have them flex over. The more flexibility you have with your resources, the more you can allow your utilization to stay low on a particular resource, but still utilize all your engineering time. So two big takeaways from the way that Toyota operates. Um, a lot of what you'll hear talked about with lean is waste reduction. And so I just thought it was worthwhile, as we're touching on this, to look at some of the parallels between like a traditional manufacturing waste and what we might say in software development. And I think the most important one, because it sort of cascades down and causes all the rest, is overproduction. Doing something before it needs to be done causes all other waste to happen. So adding extra features when the customer isn't willing to pay for them, it's not necessary. It doesn't help. It doesn't help anybody. And I think this is really the topic that we're going to talk about a little bit later tonight with the Lean Startup. Um, in talking about a development model, we can't not address the waterfall model. I'm sure if any of you have had like a project management course, um, this is kind of how we introduce the topic. And the idea here is that uh, once you define the requirements and start cascading down the waterfall, you're not allowed to go back up, right? Get all your requirements first and then move on. But of course it doesn't work like that. Of course we have to go back and do rework because we don't know all the requirements when we start. Well, uh, a lean model uh, introduces what we call today set-based concurrent engineering. And we could you know, have a series of lecture or a whole class on set-based concurrent engineering. But the idea is basically to bring forth sets of solutions through each design iteration. And, and not just like, like think of the idea, but really develop the solution. What we end up doing is spending more money because it costs money to, to maintain sets of solutions. But out here at the beginning of the project, uh, multiple changes mm -hmm. are cheap. As we get to the end, when more of the project is defined, it's incredibly expensive to make those changes. So we bring forth sets and refine them as we go. With anything, right? There's no tried and true way to do all of this stuff. We know that the, we can't just have an infinite number of sets. So we know that there's, there's some optimum in there, right? At each additional set, it only adds so much additional benefit. So I think you know, what I really want to say with all this stuff is there's all these methods out there to tell you how to manage and control your work. And the reality is 
You just need to figure out what's right for your situation and then change the universe around you so that it works best for whatever you're given. Don't, don't let the work just happen to you. You know, control the work. And I think that's what Toyota did the best. Um, we didn't get very far in this. This is like a you know, 30,000 foot view. But I think some other things worth mentioning are Lean Startup, which is really about product development and, and defining your product. Um, Scrum and Agile, which is more of a management framework to employ the stuff. And of course, process improvement and development workflow models, which we could go on for hours about. But I think we're at the end. Um, I hope you'll take away that the work that is around you is, is happening in a way that, that you can control. And so in whatever development strategy you choose, uh, see if it works. If it doesn't, try something else. If it doesn't, try something else. You know, this, this controlling the way that your team goes about working is, is really powerful and can, can take a lot of costs and uh, a lot of time out of your development process. So uh, thanks.